Current levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have already locked in a set of worsening climate hazards and impacts, and that's regardless of how successful mitigation policies end up proving to be. So this means that we have to adapt to increasing exposure to climate hazards and impacts by those greenhouse gas concentrations that are locked in. However, how people experience these climate change hazards and impacts is locally unique, and the ability to adapt to climate change is unevenly distributed. And it's unevenly distributed either between states or across the world's human population. So our discussion today is going to cover the key concepts of climate vulnerability, adaptation and resilience. So these are the key concepts that underpin this story. Provisions for adaptation and resilience are a, are a key component of the UNFCCC Treaty and of the Paris Agreement. And indeed, one of the key points of emphasis for developing countries in the Paris Agreement is the provision for finance of climate adaptation administered via the Green Climate Fund and a couple of other mechanisms. But is it enough to just throw money at developing countries? Are the dominant top-down models of development assistance effective and appropriate for climate adaptation? And will developed countries ultimately pony up with the money? Let's explore these questions in some more detail. In this video, we're gonna first look at adaptation, vulnerability and risk. Then we'll look at elements of adaptive capacity. We'll explore the limits of adaptation. And finally, we'll touch on where adaptation is featured in the UNFCCC treaty regime. Let's begin by getting clear on our key concepts climate vulnerability, climate risk, adaptive capacity and resilience. And these concepts are important because they underpin the other topics that we'll cover through the remaining weeks of Poll3 IPC. Now, according to the IPCC, climate resilience is the capacity of environmental, social and economic systems to cope with climate hazards and impacts. Adaptive capacity, on the other hand, is the ability of the human actors within those systems to adjust to potential damage, to take advantage of any opportunities that exist, or to respond to the consequences of those hazards and impacts. Now, on the surface, resilience and adaptive capacity in systems might seem very similar. And it's true that, as defined here, they're very aligned. Now, one way to remember the difference is that resilience is a broader system property that may have to do with the interplay of human and natural systems. Adaptive capacity, meanwhile, is more narrowly focused on what we do to contribute to the resilience of those systems through the specific skills, strategies and interventions of the human actors involved from international institutions and governments to communities and individuals. So for our purposes here, the political aspect of resilience lies in the human actions that either build or reduce adaptive capacity. Climate risk is about the potential for adverse consequences where something of value is at stake and where the occurrence and the degree of an outcome is uncertain. The climate risk for any given location results from the interaction of its climate vulnerability, as well as the frequency and magnitude of, it, of its exposure to climate hazards and impacts. So it's vulnerability plus frequency and magnitude of exposure. This map here is the 2020 Climate Risk Index, which is published by the NGO German Watch. And this ranks countries in order from highest to lowest climate risk. So the maroon coloured countries are at the top 10 listed countries of highest risk. Australia's uh, a little bit further back from that, it's ranked 43rd in terms of climate risk globally, but that's still quite high. Now these kind of comparative stats are important because climate vulnerability and risk analysis are an important element of how governments and international institutions develop climate adaptation strategies. Because climate risk and adaptive capacity are location specific, vulnerability does vary widely across communities, across sectors, and even across regions. And this is because climate vulnerability is a function of the climate hazard risk and adaptive capacity. So climate vulnerability can be analysed in terms of economic vulnerability and geographic vulnerability as well. So that's where you get the, the earth component and the human component coming together. 
If we look at the maps, compare the 2020 Fragile States Index map on the top with the global map of climate vulnerability from Maplecroft on the bottom. The Fragile States Index is a good proxy for comparing the adaptive capacities of states. So what you see through this comparison is some significant correlation with the areas of high climate vulnerability in the bottom map. But that, cor that correlation isn't total. So some strong states have high climate vulnerability because of their higher climate hazard risk and vice versa. So vulnerability assessments can be useful in order to identify where adaptation interventions are most needed to plan for and to implement appropriate adaptation measures and to prioritize uh, the provisioning of resources. International comparisons of vulnerability tend to focus on national indicators to compare relative risk and relative adaptive capacities. So that's what we've done with the global climate adaptation map that we just look like. This, this gives you the relative comparison. At a national level, vulnerability assessments contribute to setting adaptation priorities and monitoring progress of policy implementation. So it's a little bit more fine grained. So this graphic here is from the current Australian National Climate Resilience and Adaptation Strategy. And it shows the priority areas in the Australian government's National Climate Vulnerability Assessment. If we drill down a bit further at an industry or sector level, vulnerability assessments provide targeted detail for specific industries. While at a local or community level, Vulnerable, vulnerable groups can be identified and coping strategies can be implemented with this kind of information. And it's best to employ participatory methods when adaptation measures are implemented appropriately. So getting local actors involved gets you the best information and enables you to implement policies with the most effectiveness. And this is something that I'll get back to later in this video. But again, if we look at the graphic and, and we consider vulnerability more broadly, it's a timely reminder of the diabolical public policy problem that climate change is, to borrow the phrase from Ross Garneau. And it reminds us of the complexity of climate policy across all levels of governance. Let's look at adaptive capacity now and evaluate the different factors that comprise adaptive capacity. So as I said earlier, the ability to adapt to climate change isn't distributed equally, either between states or between people within states. And there's lots of cleavages like class, ethnicity, gender, age, ability, where you live, among other things. So all of these intersect with climate vulnerability and they intersect with adaptive capacity in complex ways. Many of the world's economies are poorly adapted to climate risk and the accelerating pace of climate change could heighten this danger considerably. So effective climate adaptation is every bit a project of political, social and cultural justice as it is a technical economic problem. There are several important factors that together determine the relative adaptive capacity of a given location. And first, I want to look at the economic element. So economic resources are a critical factor, regardless of whether we're talking about countries, cities, families, or individual people. And that's because simply put, having financial resources available provides a greater range of options for dealing with a crisis and a greater buffer of economic resilience to deal with that crisis. In addition, strong adaptive capacity requires an equitable distribution of wealth. So large wealth disparities reduce overall adaptive capacity. A dog-eat-dog -dog scramble for survival decreases community cohesion, and it decreases the likelihood that people will work together in crisis situations. Now in the graphic here, we see a time series of the top 20 countries by GDP from 1945 to 2020. This makes it pretty clear which countries have the most economic power, but also how economic power changes over time. The countries at the top of this table are most likely to have strong adaptive capacities, and that makes them more resilient to, to climate shocks because they've got the resources to deal with them. However, this isn't always the case, and that's so the, the economic dimension is really important, but it's not the only element of adaptive capacity that comes into play.
Successful adaptation requires policymakers and the community to both have timely access to appropriate information. Focused planning for adaptation is only possible when information about local vulnerabilities and information about vulnerability mitigation options are available, which requires a well-resourced research sector, a la universities. It also requires uh, governments and businesses and communities to have skilled people on hand that can implement that adaptation information effectively, particularly in crisis situations where that, that skills base can save lives. So you can see the important role that education institutions provide in research and training in the building of adaptive capacity and resilience. On top of this, adaptation is also enhanced by communities having access to appropriate technologies now, this could include things like warning systems for storms or bushfires, or protective structures like seawalls to protect against ocean storm surges or bushfire refuges. Uh, but there's many other examples of appropriate adaptive technologies, uh, and the technologies that are appropriate in a given situation will be different depending on the, the location and the community that you're talking about. But let's come back to the Fragile States Index for a moment and the lesson that this tells us about strong and stable government in relation to climate adaptation and resilience. So financial resources, information, skills and technologies, infrastructure, all of these things are best mobilised through a strong and stable government. Well-organised institutions are characterised by stable governance and effective policy arrangements provide the scaffolding to support climate adaptation implementation. So if we look again at the 2020 Fragile States Index, and this is published and updated annually by the Fund for Peace, this gives us a strong clue as to the countries that are stronger in this area. Now, just as an aside, as an international relations practitioner, this is a data set that I keep my eye on every year. So the 2021 version of the Fragile States Index will be very interesting because it'll factor in the impacts of the COVID pandemic. So some of these countries might that you see here might be a lot more fragile uh, than they appear on this map in the next iteration. I just also mentioned infrastructure. Well, adaptive capacity depends on the strength or the weakness of the physical infrastructure in a region or in a community. The absence of infrastructure makes it more difficult to assist impacted populations in a crisis situation. Now, I want to cite an example here from my own research on North Korea, which is illustrative. So if we look at North Korea, the national road network there is largely made up of unpaved dirt roads, uh, one of which is pictured here in this photo that I took near Rason in the country's north back in 2013. So why is this important? Well, Every time there's a major flooding event, these unpaved roads get washed away and they're made impassable. So this makes it hard for the government and for other aid providers to get first responders and to get emergency supplies to affected communities. Also, there's a funny looking truck in this picture. So the truck you see here is called a smoker truck. And it's called this because it runs on a wood burning engine in the tray. Now this technology is in use because of the chronic energy shortages that exist in North Korea. So it's very difficult to get uh, petroleum uh, to uh, power vehicles there. So this is why you see this kind of uh, really archaic technology uh, pretty widely in use. And this is another major downward pressure on North Korea's adaptive, adaptive capacity to environmental shock. So the energy security situation is a big deal. And part of that is because the energy distribution infrastructure is really old and decrepit there. And finally, social capital is a key to increasing adaptive capacity. So successful adaptation often depends on networks of reciprocity within and across communities, or the connections within and between social groups. You know, the kind of network connections that bind people together on an interpersonal level. And the goodwill we have towards others and which others might have towards us, this is a valuable resource, particularly in times of stress or in crisis or disaster situations. Now, inequality, social exclusion and bigotry, these things reduce social capital uh, because they destroy the bonds between people and they keep communities separated, right? So these things, 
inequality, social exclusion and bigotry, this is really maladaptive when it comes to climate adaptation. And it makes us and our communities less resilient to climate related shocks. Now, unfortunately, wealth inequalities and discrimination against marginalized populations are deeply embedded into political institutions whose decision making tends to reflect and reinforce these power disparities. And unfortunately, that's a pattern we see in most countries around the world to varying degrees. And we've seen this as a liability in the context of the COVID pandemic as well. Uh, and it's just as much of a liability in the context of climate change. And I want to stress this very strongly. A climate resilient society is a just society. Let me repeat that. A climate resilient society is a just society. Climate adaptation inevitably crosses over with social justice issues. And this is something we'll come back to in later weeks, but I really strongly want to stress this point. Let's think about the limits to adaptation for a moment now. And it, to do this can help to kind of visualize the decision-making process that happens when people and, and communities and, and governments are faced with adaptation decisions in real time in crisis situations. So take a look at this decision making tree. Now, this has been compiled uh, in an article by Robert McLemon and Barry Smith. Uh, you can see the reference at the top of the slide if you want to check this out. Now, this graphic maps the series of choices that can lead people to choosing migration as an adaptation strategy. As you walk through this decision making tree, you can see that migration is usually the last resort for people when their family assets or household assets are exhausted and when their community networks and social capital breaks down. I encourage you to pause the video here and work through this diagram. I mean, it is a rudimentary decision making tree, but it's, it's well worth walking through it to see uh, how this decision making process might work in practice. Now, I think the lesson from the Smith and McLemon diagram is that sometimes adaptation and resilience are not enough. What their graphic illustrates is that even under the best circumstances, adaptation has limits. Even at locations that have strong adaptive capacity, they might pass thresholds where adaptive practices can no longer buffer adequately against climate change impacts. So that means the magnitude and frequency of these climate impacts and hazards has become too much. It's overburdened any possible human response. So there are circumstances in which climate vulnerability outweighs adaptive capacity and where the risks and the costs of sticking it out in a given location become unviable. Now, the IPCC describes this in terms of adaptation limits. Uh, and they say this is the point at which an actor's objectives or the system's needs that they're in can't be secured from intolerable, intolerable risks through adaptive actions. Adaptation limits in any given place can be either hard limits or soft limits. So a soft adaptation limit is where options are not currently available to people to avoid intolerable risks. So this is a situation that could be changed through enhancing mitigation measures or investing in adaptive capacity. So that's something where human agency might change the balance and increase the buffer, increase the adaptation limit uh, through further investment in adaptive capacity. However, a hard adaptation limit is where there's no possible adaptive, action, adaptive actions that could avoid intolerable risks. So in these cases, the best adaptive response is to leave. And so this is the hard adaptation limit. That's the last decision that you see in McLemon and Smith's uh, climate decision-making diagram. Sometimes also governments and communities and businesses, they might adopt ad adaptation strategies that increase vulnerability uh, unintentionally and make problems worse. So this is known as maladaptation. Maladaptation occurs when the actions taken to avoid or to reduce climate vulnerability inadvertently damage or increase the vulnerability of systems uh, or increase the vulnerability of sectors or social groups within those systems. And maladaptations can lead to a number of negative outcomes. So they can end up increasing greenhouse gas emissions rather than bringing them down. 
They can disproportionately burden the most vulnerable people in the community uh, instead of making them more resilient. Maladaptations can impose high opportunity costs, which are the benefits that are lost when choosing one alternative over another. So that's why policy choice, there, there's real costs imposed in choosing one option or another, uh, and that can lock you into a, uh, a policy pathway for a long period of time. And maladaptations can also reduce incentives for further adaptation measures or lock in these path dependencies where future adaptation decisions are constrained by the original maladaptive choice. Now, I love that picture in this slide, the Fossil of the Day Award. This is given out by civil society groups each year at the UNFCCC Conference of Parties to actors within the official process that get it wrong uh, on climate policy and try and obstruct the process. But I think it's, it's relevant to what I'm going to talk about here. So despite access to all of the excellent information and the documented experience, the statistical records and the scientific knowledge on climate vulnerabilities, examples of maladaptation are continuously found across all governments and societies. But how does this happen? There's lots of reasons for this. So one, that the contest of power in politics often distorts adaptation policy choices. And that's because politics is a process that's messy. Politics is a process in which groups in a society compete over the division and the distribution of resources and services. It's a competitive process, it's a bargaining process. And this involves competition over both the procedure or the who gets to decide, as well as competition over the outcomes or the meaning of who gets what. In this contest for access to these resources, there's winners and there's losers. And as we know, politics isn't a fair fight and the ability to exercise power in the political process is not evenly shared. And this can play out in climate policy as we've seen very clearly uh, over time. But sometimes maladaptation is caused by inept leaders who just make poor decisions. Sometimes leaders tend to blame disasters related to maladaptation on other reasons, or they blame things on other circumstances besides their own ineptitude and stupidity. Leaders can make bad decisions through ideological blindness, and this can lead them to interpret events through a very narrow ideological filter that causes them to dismiss important information and dismiss evidence that doesn't conform to their worldview. So there's a confirmation bias at work. Uh, and you can see climate denial fits into this category. Also, as we've seen in Australian politics, leaders can become so absorbed in partisan political competition that their consuming need to score points against their political opponents overrides their capacity for rational decision making. And this allows climate vulnerabilities to deteriorate in the policy vacuum that's created by the endless competition. However, the process of adaptation decision making is more complex than just about power struggles over who gets what, how and when. Now, usually poor decision making from leaders combines with the systemic incentives of bureaucracies, and this leads to maladaptations. So governments implement policy through bureaucracy. So this is what the public service is. They implement government policy. And the public service, which is a structure of bureaucracies, has these bureaucracies have their own structural logics of governmentality. Now, governmentality is a concept that was first articulated by the French philosopher Michel Foucault. And in governmentality, the idea is that policy problems are identified and classified, and then they're ordered and arranged into a format that conforms to the mechanical processes, procedures, and rules of institutional hierarchy. So when we talk about the bureaucratic machine, this is kind of what we mean. Government policies are operationalized through standard operating procedures, and these are linear and mechanical, and they separate the policy into sort of discrete, non-specialized work outputs, discrete, non-specialized tasks that then individuals and work units are tasked to carry out. So what, when you implement a, a policy, what comes out at the back end, what emerges are standardized templates 
uh, of policy action. The templates by design that are tailored to the needs of the institution and not necessarily to the original intent of the policy or to the needs of the people and the communities that the policies are for. So once you understand the logic of bureaucratic structure, the seemingly crazy behaviours of government institutions become more intelligible. Now, this is not about any evil intent by the people who work in these institutions, but rather it's an organising logic of the bureaucratic institutions themselves. It's a function of the structure. And that structure tends to churn out administrative processes that are generic and that are disempowering. Uh, and you will have had much experience with this uh, in your own lives. If you've ever had to deal with the disingenuous bureaucracy of Centrelink or of public health institutions, uh, or even on campus, if you sat in the library foyer with a numbered ticket waiting to be called to speak with someone from Ask La Trobe, you've had a taste of this bureaucratic logic. But let's zoom back out now to the international level and we'll have a look at how adaptation has been embedded into the UNFCCC regime really since its inception. And it's discussed explicitly in the UNFCCC text. And these details are also mapped out in further detail in the text of the Paris Agreement. Under the Paris Agreement, the UNFCCC Conference of Parties established the National Adaptation Plan or NAP process in 2010. And they did so in 2010, we had COP16 at Cancun in Mexico. And here, the parties agreed to enable states to formulate and implement national adaptation plans as a means of identifying medium and long-term adaptation needs and to develop implementation strategies to address those needs. And particularly for developing countries whose adaptation needs are likely to be greater. If we look at the text specifically, financial support for adaptation in developing countries is outlined in Article 9 of the Paris Agreement. And this is where you see a mandate for the establishment of the Green Climate Fund to expedite support for the formulation and implementation of national adaptation plans. So this is the agency that administers the money uh, for the implementation of Article 9. If we look at Articles 10 through 12 of the Paris Agreement, these include provisions for technology transfer from developed to developing countries, as well as capacity building assistance for developing countries based on their identified needs in their national action plans. Article eight of the Paris Agreement is about loss and damage. And this builds in a recognition of the idea of adaptation limits. And it also formalizes the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage, which is the institution within the UNFCCC that's dedicated specifically to this issue. And the concept springs from the reality that there are some climate change impacts that can't be adapted to, impacts that are so severe that they leave in their wake permanent or significantly damaging effects. So for vulnerable countries, really vulnerable countries, the standalone representation of loss and damage in the Paris Agreement and the creation of the Warsaw International Mechanism, this represented major wins. So think of low-lying states that are really vulnerable to sea level rise and are likely to be inundated over this century. This Article 8 in the Paris Agreement was really important for them. The loss and damage article calls on countries to cooperate around early warning systems, around disaster preparedness, around risk assessment and management, and also insurance. So remember the importance of insurance in the context of climate economics, as we looked at in previous weeks. Article 8 also mandates greater cooperation in building the resilience of communities, uh, in building resilience for livelihoods and ecosystems, and in understanding non-economic losses associated with climate change such as damage to sites with cultural or historic importance uh, or the loss of culture through loss of land space. So we'll come back to the loss and damage idea again when we look at sea level rise in week nine, because this is very important to that topic. The UNFCCC approach to adaptation sounds great on paper, but it's not all roses. There's definitely problems with it. So I want to really problematize the top-down approach to adaptation that we see in this process. 
So the top-down governance approach of the governmentality bureaucratic model, so as I mentioned earlier, this has often proven to be ineffective for climate adaptation and local level capacity building. So while strong institutional capacity is definitely important to climate adaptation, how institutions interact with the people that they're intending to help is just as important because if they do it badly, it can derail the whole adaptation process. In the context of international climate adaptation, the one size fits all outputs of international institutions and of governments and of many big NGOs, these are often ill suited to local conditions. They can disregard local knowledges and they can rob people on the ground of agency and decision making about their own lives. And in the process, this wastes a tremendous amount of resources and can make problems worse. So that's a good example of maladaptation. And the institutions that behave in this way are often accused of being more interested in ticking boxes for their bureaucratic process than actually working towards tangible outcomes. This can also contribute to the continued disenfranchisement of First Nations peoples around the world in global climate governance. Even where improving Indigenous representation has been a conscious priority, and we'll come back to this point again in week 11. The emerging best practice in adaptation and resilience is often better undertaken from the grassroots through locally led initiatives that end up getting institutional support. So starting out at the community level, taking advantage of on the ground expertise and the high resolution information about local conditions that local people tend to have, rather than the prescriptive top down interventions that are often promoted by international institutions. There's an emerging discourse and practice in, in the international development sector in particular, uh, including in a lot of NGOs, that rejects the externally imposed interventions of that top-down model and instead champions local level knowledge and decision making. A climate resilient society is a society where people have direct agency in their adaptation choices. To illustrate, the video clip we're watching here is from the Centre for International Forestry Research. Now, what they're doing here is mapping out a process that goes into locally led resilience initiatives. So in this case, it's a case study for developing ecologically sustainable coffee farming and forestry polyculture systems for peasant farmers in Colombia. Now, unfortunately, this understanding of adaptation best practice has been slower to filter into the operations of governments and international institutions. Also of note and relevant to our discussion last week on post-carbon economic transitions are the growing calls for a green-led economic recovery to the COVID pandemic that emphasises climate adaptation and decarbonisation, a la Green New Deal type development programs uh, and sustainable development and eco-modernization initiatives. Now, this isn't just a call from progressive activists. This is coming from a diverse range of interests across the economy and across the world. For one, you've got Christiana Figueres, the founder of Global Optimism, which is an NGO, but more famously, the ex-executive secretary of the UNFCCC, who compared COVID and climate change to massive waves crashing on a beach. And she called for an injection of capital from global, ec global economies that's both green and socially inclusive. The Green Climate Fund is also calling for green-led economic recovery, arguing that climate action and COVID-19 economic stimulus measures can be mutually supportive. And especially in developing countries, which uh, should be able to access long-term affordable finance to implement some of these green recovery measures. <laughs>